Hello class and welcome to this week's lecture on the limbic system and emotional disorders in of course brain and behavior. So let's dive into the biological components of the limbic system and emotions and in this part of our lecture as always we're going to uh, cover a historical researcher and their legacy as well as a little bit of the limbic system, the biological components of the limbic system, and also the role of some neurotransmitters and the basics of a simple emotion like shame and disgust. And we'll also explore a little bit more on science of happiness. And then in our next part of our lecture, we will explore specific types of emotional disorders. So let's dive into it, shall we? Well, today I'd like to uh, begin by bringing some attention to an influential researcher who's made some significant contributions to our understanding of the biological basis of emotions. Jaak Panskip, uh, who is a renowned neuroscientist and psychobiologist, who specifically uh, pioneering work in affective neuroscience, uh, focusing primarily upon neural mechanisms underlying emotions. Now his groundbreaking work uh, has paved the way for a deeper understanding of the biological foundations of our emotional experiences. And his work is best known for studying the basic emotions that are hardwired into the brain of both humans and animals. And he's identified several primary emotional systems, uh, including a, a seeking, that is exploration and curiosity, as well as rage. We all intuitively know what rage is. It's anger and aggression, as well as fear, which is anxiety and avoidance. And of course, play, which is social and joyful interactions. And Penskeeps conducted some extensive research, particularly on animal models, uh, primarily rats, to investigate the neural circuits and behaviors associated with these different emotions. And his work has really helped to bridge the gap between animal and human emotional experiences, shedding some light on the common neurobiological substrates of each. And Penskeep's research really emphasized the importance of the specific brain circuits in regulating our emotional states. And he highlights the role particularly of the subcortical structures, such as the amygdala and the limbic system in orchestrating our emotional responses. And so as far as the therapeutic implication of Penskeep's work, Uh, it really kind of, you know, while his work is, uh, may seem as pure research, it really has some, some important insights into the neurobiology of emotions and how it contributes to the novel therapeutic approaches of mood disorders and emotional dysregulation, particularly when it comes to things like the importance of rules like cognitive behavioral therapy, which, uh, seeks to establish some um, some controls upon those subcortical systems. So that's uh, a key researcher that I hope that you keep in mind as we think about all the things we learn here. Now, what I'd like to do next is provide a little bit of an overview of the limbic system, including what we mean by the limbic system. Uh, really, the limbic system is a critical collection of brain structures responsible for, for regulating emotions and memory and various other functions that are related to our emotional experience. Now, as far as the term itself, limbic, uh, is a term kind of derived from the Latin word limbus, which means the border or edge. And so in the context of neuroscience, 
Limbic refers to the location of the limbic system. It forms a border or edge between those older, more primitive parts of our brain, such as our brain stem, the things that kind of keep us alive, and the newer, more advanced parts, such as the cerebral cortex that make us human. And so its positioning really highlights its pivotal role as bridging the gap between, essentially between survival and having a high quality of life. And that gives us a sense of the role that it plays as well. Now, as far as the location of the limbic system, it's primarily situated deep within the brain, uh, encircling the upper part of the brain stem. So it's kind of nestled beneath the cerebral cortex. It forms really this complex neck work of interconnected structures each has their own part to play um, one of the primary roles of the limbic system is in regulation of emotions so it processes and interprets emotional stimuli and it allows us to experience and express feelings like joy or fear or anger or sadness and the limbic system particularly the hippocampus plays a crucial role in the formation and consolidation of long-term memory so it helps us remember emotionally significant events and experiences and the limbic system really is comprised of several very vital structures um, including the hippocampus which is that horseshoe shaped area that we know is responsible for memory as well as the amygdala which is that little almond shaped area at the end the hypothalamus uh, as well as the thalamus and the cingulate gyrus and the basal ganglia and each of these structures contributes uh, to different aspects of emotional processing and behavior and so the limbic system is closely associated and interconnected with all the different brain regions and so it allows that system to receive some sensory input input and to integrate the emotional information and send signals to other parts of the brain and the body to in order to generate these rather automatic emotional responses and so the limbic system is considered one of the older parts of the brain in terms of the evolutionary development being that it is that go between between our higher order thinking in our cortex and our basic survival on our brainstem now as we go on and look at the biological components of the limbic system uh, i want to kind of highlight some key aspects here first off we have that hippocampus okay so that Hippocampus, as I've already mentioned, is a, that seahorse-shaped structure located within the temporal lobe, so inside, underneath the temporal lobes of the brain, and is primarily associated with memory formation as well as some spatial navigation. And in the context of emotions, the hippocampus helps us store and retrieve emotional memories, enabling us to recall past emotional experiences. So without the hippocampus, you can't really form long-term memories. And so uh, it is part of that processing. But when it comes to the emotional content, the quality of the emotions, that's where we get to the amygdala. And the amygdala is that small almond-shaped structure deep within the brain that plays a central role in processing and regulating emotions, particularly things like fear responses and emotional responses to threats and threat evaluations. And so it helps evaluate the emotional significance of sensory stimuli and triggers the appropriate emotional reactions and then we have the hypothalamus which is that critical structure located at the base of the brain and this serves as that interface between 
the nervous system and the endocrine system controlling various physiological processes, including our stress responses, our temperature regulation, our hunger and thirst and sexual behavior. And so it also influences emotional responses through the release of hormones. So you can think of uh, the amygdala as the alarm system and the hypothalamus is that system that responds to that alarm and gets the body prepared so it's the one that you know loads up the fire truck and gets the fire truck ready to go uh, it is preparing your body for something to come so for example if you're entering a stressful situation it's going to tell your body to stop being worried about processing uh, your food and be prepared to fight or to run. Then we have the thalamus. And the thalamus, of course, is that relay station in the brain that processes sensory information and it routes it to various parts of the brain and including those in the limbic system. And so it plays a role in translating external stimuli into emotional experiences by transmitting sensory data to the amygdala and other limbic system. So it decides to some extent what kinds of information should be given and how much information should be given to the amygdala, that threat sensor. Then we have the cingulate gyrus and this is part of the cerebral cortex and serves as a bridge between the limbic system and the higher cognitive functions of the brain. So it uh, plays a role in emotional processing such as empathy and social interactions and regulating emotional responses to things like pain and conflict. And then, then we have the basal ganglia. And while this isn't traditionally considered part of the limbic system, you can consider the basal ganglia as being something that's closely connected to and interacting with the limbic system so it's going to help contribute to some extent to the emotional processing by influencing motivation reward and the regulation of overall mood and emotional states and all of these biological structures work together within this limbic system to process and regulate emotions forming that intricate neural circuits that underlie our emotional experiences and help us to adapt to and prepare for very quickly the needs that our body may have. And that's the primary role of the limbic system. So let's take a look more deeply at the amygdala. Again, the amygdala is a small almond-shaped structure located within the brain, specifically in the, the temporal lobe, so at the ends of the hippocampus on each side of the, the uh, brain. And it's widely recognized for its central role in processing and regulating emotions, particularly fear and emotional responses from various stimuli. So the Amygdala really serves as a hub for the processing of emotional information. It evaluates the emotional significance of sensory stimuli such as facial expressions and voices or environmental cues and assigns emotional value to them. And one of the primary functions of the amygdala is the detection of potential threats in the environment. When the amygdala perceives a threat, it initiates a rapid and automatic response, preparing the body to react to the danger. So it, this includes the, triggering the fight and flight response. It gives, sends the message to the rest of the body through things like the hippocampus that, hey, it's time to prepare. And so the amygdala also plays a crucial role in the formation and storage of emotional memories. It helps encode and consolidate memories associated with emotionally charged events, making them more salient and easier to recall. So if you ever talk to someone that is 
uh, depressed and you can kind of think of depression in terms of the amygdala being too sensitive and so when you talk to someone that's depressed what you'll get is particularly when you talk about memories is lots of negative memories because they've been encoded to buy the amygdala to be the most salient the most important memories and the ones that are easiest to recall and oftentimes a person can get caught in what we call ruminations which are just basically regurgitating of these old negative memories and that kind of keeps and self-perpetuates depression the amygdala also plays a role beyond fear processing uh, where it's involved in social and emotional learning so it helps individuals to recognize and interpret the emotions of others feeling empathy and understanding and in social interactions so here's where um, because the amygdala varies its sensitivity varies from person to person some people are very resistant to anxiety and depression because their amygdala doesn't work as fast but because of that those people are also um, less able to interpret and empathize with others because they they, they it, their amygdala simply isn't is sensitive on the upside they're much more resilient and resist things like anxiety and depression so there's that bit of a balance that goes on here and that kind of ties us into emotional disorders because when you have a dysregulation of the amygdala that's associated with various emotional disorders including anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders PTSD and so understanding the amygdala's role is really crucial in developing treatments for these conditions and of course, the amygdala demonstrates a degree of plasticity, meaning that it can change and adapt over time. And this plasticity allows it to learn and adjust its responses to different emotional experiences and stimuli. So there is a place for learning in the overall treatment of dysregulation of the amygdala so we can always be mindful of that and be thankful for that now we also have the raphe nucleus which is a very interesting structure that i haven't really mentioned a whole lot about the raphe nuclei are a group of nuclei located in the brainstem particularly in the midline of the brainstem the hind portion and this nuclei are essential parts of the brain's neurotransmitter systems and play a crucial role in regulating mood and emotion and various physiological functions. Now, the Raphe nuclei are primarily responsible for producing and releasing this neurotransmitter serotonin. And serotonin is a key player in regulating mood and emotion and sleep and appetite, making the Raphe nucleus a critical member of your emotional well-being. And you need to kind of remember what serotonin is. Serotonin is kind of like your everything is okay, everything is peaceful kind of neurotransmitter so it doesn't make you giddy and happy but it sets up the emotional state so that you can feel happy without serotonin you, you, there isn't going to be happiness so serotonin is released from the raphe nuclei and that influences the emotional states and helps to regulate the intensity as well as the duration of your emotional responses. So proper serotonin function is associated with a, a stable and a positive mood, while imbalances may contribute to mood disorders like depression and anxiety. And the Raphe nuclei are involved in the brain's response to stress. They modulate the body's reaction to stressors by influencing the release of stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which in turn affect emotional responses. And the raphe nuclei are 
really interconnected with various system structures within the limbic system, um, including the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And these connections enable the raphe nuclei to modulate emotional processing within the limbic system. And, of course, serotonin production by the raphe nuclei is crucial in things like regulation of sleep, wake cycles. So disturbances in serotonin levels can lead to sleep disorders and impact our emotional well-being. And there are many medications used to treat mood disorders, such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, which we'll talk about more as this lecture goes on. But that really targets the serotonin system by increasing serotonin levels kind of in a backward way. It doesn't influence the production of more serotonin, but rather the it slows down the depletion process of serotonin. Uh, but that can help to make up for any lack of function within the raphe nuclei. And, of course, with all individuals, there's some individual variability in the functioning of the raphe nuclei. And that contributes to some differences in the emotional resilience and susceptibility to mood disorders that some people will have. Uh, there's also genetic and environmental factors that play into this as well. Now, I also want to highlight here just a little bit about other neurotransmitters since we've kind of started on this road of neurotransmitters. You need to kind of remember neurotransmitters are those chemical messengers that play a fundamental role in transmitting signals between the nerve cells and the brain and are critical for modulating things like emotions. So, to kind of start off with, neurons are what communicate with each other across the synapses by the releasing of these neurotransmitters, which are the junctions between the neurons. And there are multiple types of neurotransmitters in our brain. There is things like serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine and gamma immunobutyric acid, something we call GABA, as well as others. Now, as far as serotonin goes, it's associated with regulating mood, calming down anxiety, and setting the stage for your overall emotional well-being. So imbalances or lack of serotonin is linked to mood disorders like depression and anxiety. Then there's dopamine. And dopamine is often referred to as the feel-good neurotransmitter. So it plays a role in reward and pleasure and motivation and reinforcement. So dysregulation of dopamine is implicated in addiction and conditions like schizophrenia. Then there's norepinephrine, which is involved in the body's stress response and emotional arousal and it contributes to a heightened alertness and vigilance during emotionally charged situations. And then we have a ga gamma immunobutyric acid, which is GABA, uh, and that's an inhibitory neurotransmitter that helps to regulate anxiety and stress. And it counters kind of the effects of excitatory neurotransmitters and promotes more relaxation and calmness. Uh, one of the things that's really important to remember is that neurotransmitter balance is key. You shouldn't have too much of a neurotransmitter nor too little. And to have too much or too little can cause significant problems, particularly when it comes to emotional stability. And imbalance is is something that can happen due to genetic factors. Different people are just simply wired in different ways and so uh, experiences are going to affect them differently and going to set the regulation systems, particularly early in life. But there's also things like trauma, um, disease, other disorders can cause or lead to mood disorders and emotional regulation. Fortunately, we have medications and therapies that can target many of these. For example, antidepressants are often 
used to focus on serotonin, while medications like uh, for disorders like ADHD uh, impact things like dopamine. Now, of course, there are other substances within our lives that can often impact neurotransmitter function and can disrupt the neurotransmitter systems. So things like alcohol and caffeine are obvious ones, but also recreational drugs work on directly neurotransmitter function and consequently on emotional states. And so this oftentimes can have uh, an impact not only on the short-term mood alteration, but also in the development of addictions and of long-term emotional instability. Now, let's go on and explore and delve in a little more deeply into the one of the key regulating neurotransmitters, uh, particularly for mood and anxiety, and that's serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that has been extensively studied for its influence on various emotional states and its involvement in mood disorders. And so serotonin is often referred to, you can think of it as the feeling safe neurotransmitter. And if you don't feel safe, you're not going to be even open to being happy. And so it kind of lays the foundation for happiness and emotional stability. And the proper serotonin function contributes to, of course, a positive emotional state, helping people to experience joy and contentment and a sense of well-being. And so imbalances of serotonin are linked to mood disorders like depression and anxiety. And serotonin is produced, as I've already mentioned, in the raphe nuclei of the brain stem, and it travels through the brain via specific pathways, and these pathways connect to various limbic system structures, including the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And so serotonin modulates emotional processing within the limbic system, and it influences how individuals respond to emotional stimuli and regulates emotional reactions and basically opens you up. The more serotonin, the more you're open up to positive experiences. With a lack of serotonin in a particular system, thinking becomes very negative and the interpretation of experiences takes on a negative tone and the memories that get consolidated take on a negative tone. And so with low levels of serotonin, there is heightened anxiety and excessive worry. And so obviously imbalances of serotonin are associated with things like anxiety disorders and anxiety and depression are biologically very much linked and phenomenologically are very much comorbid. That is, if you have one, you're more likely to have the other. Serotonin is involved in also regulating social behaviors such as empathy and cooperation and influences an individual's ability to connect with others emotionally. So diet and lifestyle factors can impact serotonin levels as well. Um, for example, foods rich in tryptophan, and which is an amino acid that's a precursor to serotonin, uh, has been thought to promote serotonin production. Uh, the, also things like exercise, regular exercise and exposure to natural light are thought to contribute positively to serotonin levels. Now, serotonin function, of, the, of course, can vary just like all neurotransmitters between people, and so you need to kind of be mindful of that as you are considering the role of serotonin within the system. Now, I want to delve in now into the biology of anxiety and fear which are two emotions that are really intricately linked and have profound implications for our mental and emotional well-being. Now, as far as the 
structures involved in the biology of fear, we need to first off think of the amygdala's role because the amygdala is a key component of the limbic system and plays a central role in the processing of fear and anxiety. It really acts as an emotional alarm system detecting potential threats within the environment. And when the amygdala perceives a threat, it initiates a rapid and automatic fear response. Um, it's not going to wait around for your brain, to, your frontal lobe to catch up, your conscious self to catch up. It is going to start the process immediately because it perceives a danger. And this includes physiological changes like increased heart rate, heightened alertness, and the release of stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, preparing the body to respond to danger. And so anxiety can be seen as a generalized form of fear. Now, while fear is often a response to a specific immediate threat, anxiety involves a more prolonged and diffuse sense of apprehension and worry about potential future threats. And imbalances in neurotransmitters, particularly serotonin and GABA, are linked to anxiety disorders. So low serotonin levels are associated with increased anxiety, while GABA acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter that can help calm the nervous system. And the prefrontal cortex, that higher order brain region, plays a role in regulating and moderating the fear and anxiety responses generated by the amygdala. And so this helps evaluate the actual threat level of the situation and engages a more rational decision making, but it's slower. So if someone jumps up from behind the door and goes, ah, and scares you, first thing your amygdala is going to do is, say, oh, I'm going to die. And so it gets your body prepared for that. And then your prefrontal cortex finally kicks in and you realize, oh, it's your little brother, your little sister with a mask. Okay, there's no real threat there. So then you can kind of calm down, but you have to wait for your, what we call the HPA axis to calm down. And now we'll get to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The HPA axis is that complex neuroendocrine system that plays a very central role in the body's response to stress and fear. And so dysregulation of the HPA axis is associated with chronic anxiety and stress-related disorders. And so the brain has a remarkable capacity for neuroplasticity, allowing it to adapt and learn from experiences. And in the context of fear and anxiety, this can lead to the development of phobias of, uh, and the perpetuation of anxiety disorders and, of course, depression as well. And so understanding the biological basis of anxiety and fear has really led to the development of some therapeutic approaches, the most effective being cognitive behavioral therapy. And essentially what we're doing there is training the person to interpret things in a more positive light, to counter the automatic system that's been going on of interpreting everything in a negative emotional light. And over time, over the period of months, the system can begin to change where anxiety then can be lifted and depression can be lifted. There's also exposure therapy where you are exposing someone to the stimuli and retraining that system to recognize it, that it isn't a threat. And of course, there are medications that target the neurotransmitter imbalances already to help that system along all of which goes a long way to helping the person. And as always, of course, genetic factors play a role. Um, there's that complicated interplay of early life experiences that plays a significant role. Difficult circumstances, particularly early in life, can uh, have an impact upon a person's emotional state often 20 and 30 years later. And so you need to kind of be mindful of that as we look at this whole biology of fear and anxiety and the different disorders that go along with it. Now, I want to 
spend a little bit of time on a few lesser known systems, uh, particularly having to do with the complex emotions of shame and disgust, um, as well as the neural basis, particularly uh, the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, shame and disgust are emotions that are distinct but closely related to other emotions. So shame typically arises from a sense of self-evaluation and often involves feeling embarrassed, inferior, or unworthy. And disgust, on the other hand, is a strong aversion to something considered repulsive or offensive. And you know that someone is experiencing shame or disgust when the corners of their mouth turn right downwards. Um, and so you, th that's kind of a, a good indicator that someone's feeling shame and disgust. And that's probably one of the most difficult emotions to really deal with in a person's life. They're really at rock bottom. And so there's no point in giving someone a hard time when the corners of their mouth are turned down because they're already as low as they can go. And anything that you say that's negative is not going to change anything. All it's going to do is hurt someone that's already hurting deeply. And so the anterior cingulate cortex is that region of the brain located below the frontal and parietal lobes and wraps around the head of the corpus callosum. And it plays a crucial role in processing emotional experiences, particularly those related to social and moral emotions, like shame and disgust. And research suggests that the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in the experience of shame, so it helps individuals evaluate their own behavior and actions in social context, leading to the emotional response of shame when one perceives a violation of social norms or values. And the anterior cingulate cortex is also implicated in the processing of disgust. So it assesses and evaluates stimuli that evoke disgust reactions such as unpleasant odors or repulsive images. Uh, so the anterior cingulate cortex is known for its role in conflict monitoring. So it helps individuals detect discrepancies between their behavior and their internal values and goals. And this function can contribute to the experience of shame when one's actions conflict with their own moral standards. And so the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in regulating social behavior and moral decision making and it helps individuals navigate complex social interactions, make ethical judgments, and respond to violations of social norms. And neuroimaging studies have shown increased activation of the anterior cingulate cortex during tasks that involve experiencing shame or processing morally charged stimuli. And this proves, provides some evidence that its involvement in this kind of emotion. And that's part of the reason why people will get so angry so very quickly in cases of uh, controversial topics. Um, particularly when you just think in terms of what are the topics that you're not supposed to talk about, sex, religion, and politics. Um, it will often activate your anterior cingulate cortex, uh, initiate feelings of disgust and in, in, within the person and or shame within the person. And so they will automatically get angry in the midst of a conversation simply because it's a way of trying to escape the pain that comes along with those emotions. And so these feelings of shame and disgust, um, we can often find these in conditions like social anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as certain eating disorders and, and hoarding. And so 
we can kind of uh, use that information in the therapeutic work that we do with these people. Now, since we've talked so much about kind of the negative side of emotions, I think it's important for us to also talk in terms of when things are going well within emotions. So what are the, what's the underlying biology of happiness and the brain regions associated with this positive emotion? And of course, neurotransmitters and happiness go together very well. There's several neurotransmitters that play a crucial role in regulating happiness. First off, serotonin. Serotonin says everything is safe. Dopamine says, yeah, I can engage in life. And endorphins say, yes, this is good. And it takes away a lot of the pain within life. And so these chemicals are often referred to as a grouping, the feel-good neurotransmitters. And dopamine, in particular, is strongly associated with the experience of pleasure and reward. And it's released in response to enjoyable experiences. And so that reinforces behaviors that lead to happiness. Now, there's some structures within there. There's something called the ventral striatum. It's just part of the uh, brain's reward system. And that's central in the experience of happiness and becomes active when we encounter pleasure of stimuli such as food and social interactions and other rewarding uh, experiences. Of course, the prefrontal cortex plays a role, particularly the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Uh, that's involved in the cognitive aspects of happiness and it helps us to evaluate our own well-being and make judgments about what brings us happiness and anticipate future happiness. And endorphins are those neurotransmitters that act like natural painkillers and mood elevators and so they are released during activities like exercise and laughter and you know even eating spicy foods and because physical pain and emotional pain are so closely tied together that it takes away some of that emotional pain that kind of puts a stunt on uh, happiness and so the release of endorphins simply makes you feel that much more happy and so happiness is not solely a product of an individual part of the brain's activity but it is something that is an interplay of all of the things that the brain does as well as how it's influenced by social interactions and the emotional connections that go on within life and so the brain is remarkable in its adaptability to positive and negative life events and will eventually return to a baseline happiness no matter what you do with in life. So um, the general rule is it doesn't matter how much you can win $20 million and within a thousand days, you're going to feel the same as you did before that uh, winning that $20 million is not going to change your life on its own. So you need to kind of be mindful of that, that um, external hedonistic lifestyle does not lead to an ever increasing level of happiness. More needs to happen internally than externally in order for happiness to be achieved and improved upon within life. And finally, we have our key terms for this lecture. So the things I want you to kind of be mindful of, first off, the limbic system, remembering that it's a collection of brain structures involved in regulating emotions and memory and other emotional processes and that it literally means the system along the edges so it kind of acts as that in go between between the brain stem and the frontal cortex neurotransmitters of course are those chemical messages that transmit signals between neurons in the brain serotonin is that specific neurotransmitter that uh, is associated with mood regulation and emotional well-being the amygdala Remember, is that almond-shaped brain structure crucial for processing and regulating emotions, particularly fear? The raphe nuclei are 
brainstem nuclei responsible for producing serotonin and regulating emotional states. The anterior cingulate cortex is that region of the brain involved in processing social and moral emotions like shame and disgust and of course happiness. What is happiness? It's a positive emotional state associated with the release of neurotransmitters like dopamine and endorphins. So I hope you enjoyed this part of our lecture and join us for the next part of our lecture as we continue on exploring emotions. You take care. Goodbye.